Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 143, Solitaire Fantasy, Solo Fantasy Board Games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, tonight, we've got someone who's looking for some single-player fantasy-themed games to keep her busy while her husband's out of town for work. Sorry, her boyfriend. Uh, We've also got a couple of light games for our featured reviews. We've got Circle of Six from a friend of ours, Robert M. Everson, and Aroma, a board game that actually uses your sense of smell. After that, we've got our usual weekend review with Solo Plays of Tapestry, a two-player date night game of Tokaido, and my first thoughts on the Unfair expansion. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Thank you everyone for your feedback, even if we don't read it out on the show. First up, a comment from Matthew Adams about our topic of roll and move games. The Royal Game of Ur is another roll-and-move racing game that involves a bit of strategy and could be modernized by any smart designer, like Royal Chariot Race of Ur or something. Well, thanks for the comment, Matthew. Uh, I know of the Royal Game of Ur. It was actually the one question I got wrong on our Jeopardy show we did there with Brent. Um, Being one of the earliest board games ever discovered, some people claim it's the first board game ever invented. I've actually never sat down to learn how it was played, and I honestly had no idea it was a roller move or had any racing theme to it. So thanks for that info, Matthew. Well, next up, Jay Behrens wrote in about our topic of best word-based party games to say... Mm -hmm. Paperback is easily my favorite. I used to play Scrabble competitively until they started allowing slang words like za into the game. At the time they made za legal, they claimed it was so commonly used among teenagers that everyone was aware of it or used it. I owned a gaming and comic shop at the time, and no one ever had ever heard of za prior to that. So no, it wasn't used a commonly used slang term among teens. Well, Jay, I got to say, Za is extremely common around here and always was. Everyone calls pizza Za. You go get some Za. So I can see it being a reason to quit playing Scrabble, though, for silly two-letter words that aren't really words. I totally get that. And I got to admit, I don't like Scrabble due to it being more about memorizing word lists than actually being creative with your words. Now, I am also a fan of paperback, though I'm not sure I would consider it a party game. That's more of a game that takes a lot of focus. You're not going to be chatting with other people while you're playing. Now, if you are looking for a good word game and you like paperback, check out hardback. It's more of an advanced version of paperback that involves things like various card combos and collecting sets of books with different themes like mystery and romance. All right, well, finally, Mike Riley found our three-year anniversary <laughs> Ask the Bellhop segment on YouTube and took the time to say congrats, guys, and a big thank you. You're welcome, Mike. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of things we want to mention before we get on to answering this week's question. First up, our water gate giveaway is live over on the blog where you can enter to win a copy of watergate and gate gate copy of watergate and the meeple realty insert for that two-player tug of war while the game has been played enough for time for us to review it the insert is still in shrink and ready to be built now as a special thank you to those of you here live we're dropping a code into the chat right now that will be worth two bonus entries Good luck. All right. Every year we take part in the Extra Life Charity Fundraising event. This is a gamer and gaming focused series of events that raise money for the Children's Miracle Network hospitals around the world. One of the best parts about this charity is 100% of the proceeds go to the charity. Mm -hmm. None of it is kept by Extra Life. And that money goes to support local hospitals somewhere close to home that will have a direct impact in your community. As usual, we'll be gaming to support sick kids in Toronto, Ontario. With our first Extra Life event coming up on the weekend of August 20th, which has been designated by the folk at Extra Life as Tabletop Appreciation Weekend. As part of this event, we'll be streaming something all three days, Friday, Mm -hmm. Saturday, and Sunday. 
This will be a mix of in-person gaming and online plays. The tentative times we've set are 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Friday, a full 12 hours of gaming from 1 p.m. till 1 a.m. on Saturday, and 1 p.m. till 8 p.m. on Sunday, starting with our usual brunch live show. Uh, you'll be able to watch us live at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, as well as right from our Extra Life donation page. Now, speaking of donations, the event is already open and you can donate at any time. You can go to extra-life.org and search for Tabletop Bellhop, head over to windsorextralife.com, all one word, or use the link we're just dropping in the chat or the one in the show notes. Note the windsorextralife.com will be live by the time the podcast comes out, but for those of you here joining us on Twitch on Wednesday night, we got a little bit of work to do before it goes live. Right. Now, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As usual, we would love any support you can offer. Uh, we really do stand behind this charity. Uh, this is my ninth year taking part. Uh, together with other Windsor gamers, we've raised well over 20000 US for sick kids so far, and they always need more money. Every dollar counts. Any amount you can give is appreciated. If you're fundraising yourself, we also invite you to join our team. While it's called the Windsor Extra Life, that's just how we started nine years ago, we welcome anyone from anywhere to join. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Tonight, we're, our question comes from Candace, who went over to the website and clicked on Ask the Bellhop with this question. My boyfriend went to work overseas for a year. I'm looking for challenging, single-player, fantasy-themed games to play until he returns. Any suggestions? Thank you so much for your help. Oh, thanks so much for the great question, Candice. Uh, this just happens to be a question we just received recently that I wanted to bump up to the top of the pile due to being somewhat time-sensitive. Like, It's not going to be worth answering this if Candice's boyfriend is already back. Plus, it's not a topic we ever discussed before, and I think there's some great game suggestions for this particular topic. Now, while the Bellhop has said in the past, for a, the, a solo game, he generally goes to the PlayStation, mm -hmm. we're not completely without solutions to this problem. Though lately it's become the Switch, but still, something digital. If I can't play with a bunch of people at my table, I'd rather go play something digital, but in general. So... Before I start diving into the game recommendations, I want to actually kind of break up Candace's question. It's not a long question, but there's actually a lot in there. There's a lot to unpack. So I want to highlight some of that before we get to it. So the first thing that Candace mentions is that they're looking for challenging games. This means to me some games with some weight to them, games that aren't light and quick, and games that may be difficult to win. This immediately knocks out some of my personal favorite solo games like Friday and Owner Rim. Now, I don't actually know how much gaming experience Candace has, but I'm going to assume they're not scared of heavier games while making this list. As always, heavy is a concept more than a number and mm. will vary widely for all involved. Now, the next part is, of course, single player games. That's pretty simple to, to not a lot to break down here. I think limiting this games to lists that only play one player, though, would lead me to an empty list. I, I, there aren't, as far as I know, like, unless, again, unless you count Owner Rim, any single player only fantasy games, uh, board games at least, that would be on this list. So, what I will be doing is suggesting games that can be played solo, but are actually designed for more players than that. And, well, yes, there are a ton of solo only games out there. We haven't finished narrowing down the list from the question yet. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, the next part, the theme. Candace is looking for fantasy themed games. Now, without clarification, this could mean a number of things, but we're going to, um, I think we're safe to assume this means, you know, heroic, magical fantasy elves and dragons and not say horror or urban fantasy. Now, just in case we're wrong, I'm going to make sure to mention some less swords and sorcery fantasy games in the honorable mentions tonight. So we're going to break those from the main list. The main list is going to be your D&D &D traditional fantasy games. And if you mean surrealist fantasy, drop us a note and we can work on that too. Dolly would be proud. I'm not sure if there's a solo version of Dixit out there. There isn't one that I've seen, but that definitely would get into the surrealist level. Now, the last bit that is easy to overlook is the, the quote, until he returns. This is important. Candace noted her boyfriend 
would be gone for a year. So that either means she wants lots of different games to play over that time, or possibly, and I think more likely, she wants some truly epic games that are going to take up a large chunk of that time or even the entire time. And thankfully, I've got recommendations for lots of games or just one or two big long ones. And I bet you when I talk about one or two long solo fantasy games, you probably know which ones I'm talking about. And since we're focusing on games that aren't exclusively solo, you can still introduce your partner to them when they do return mm -hmm. and have date night gaming. Now, as usual, this list is in no particular order, and make sure you stick around for a few honorable mentions at the end. All right, number one, a game that fits absolutely everything about Candace's question so perfectly that we could stop the list right here and just name one game and be done for the entire night, and that is Gloomhaven. Although I would rather say the Gloomhaven series of games, starting with Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Because now that Jaws of the Lion exists, and I have played Jaws, and I have played Gloomhaven, I strongly suggest anyone looking into get into this game series, start there. Jaws of the Lion is a fantastic onboarding tool for learning how to play Gloomhaven, as well as giving you a chance to try it out and decide if it's right for you before dropping over a hundred bucks on the big box. Now, I've always noted on the podcast before, Gloomhaven is not always what people expect. It is a rather heavy and complex resource management game where those resources are not just your hit points, it's also the cards in your hand. This is not a fantasy sword and sorcery dice checker dungeon crawler. It's challenging. And there is more than enough game here that it could literally keep someone busy for an entire year. Now, regarding playing solo, there are a large number of gamers out there that think Gloomhaven is best when played solo. So strongly recommended at solo, enough gameplay to keep you busy for a year. Again, start with Jaws just to see, because it's a good, good way for one to learn the game. And second, to see if you do dig Gloomhaven, because it may not be the fantasy you're quite looking for. Note, while there is a specific solo-only expansion out there for Gloomhaven, mm -hmm. it's only playable once the city has reached, reached level two with two retired characters and characters participating being level five or higher. So it's not something you run out and get at the start of your Gloomhaven adventures because you want to play solo. Yeah, and I own this, okay? So... It's not really a solo expansion. It's not even a solo campaign. What it is, is it's a book with one solo scenario for each character that can be unlocked in the game. And what you do is, if you finish the solo campaign, the solo scenario, just one scenario, usually three rooms, you get a unique item. And what this is actually meant for is to supplement your existing campaign. It's a way to level up your characters in the middle of an existing campaign. You can't just play the solo expansion on its own. It's like a side quest. And that was Gloomhaven. Next, I have Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. This is a big box Middle-Earth-themed fantasy game that is a progression that started with the Descent board game from Fantasy Flight and evolved into Descent 2 Imperial Assault with Middle-Earth, uh, sorry, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth being the, the culmination of that series of games so far. Now, you take on heroes in Middle-earth, but not the named heroes you would expect. There's, you're not playing the Fellowship of the Ring. You are playing elves and hobbits and humans, but you're not playing, you know, the, the Fellowship or the main characters. Now, each game you play is standalone, but it is a single adventure in a long campaign. Now, it is 100% app-driven. You cannot play this game without an app, and it's that app that lets it work as a solo play experience. Now, while I do have this, we even have an unboxing video out there. I haven't had a chance to sit down and play it myself. But based on what other people have said, board game geek information, what it said in the rules, each game should be pretty epic, taking about two hours. But I'm not sure how long the overall campaign is. Now, being a Fantasy Flight game, there are also, of course, expansions to help keep the game fresh and interesting. Now, I'm certain you're not going to get as much playtime in this as you would from, say, Gloomhaven. But this does offer some replayability because the app does randomize things out of what you own. So you can play through the campaign a second time or a third time, and it will be different from the first. 
Now, this one's big enough or important enough or caught enough people's attention that it won the 2019 Golden Geek Best Solo Game. Now, again, that's best solo game by alpha gamers, people who have taken the time to register and join Board Game Geek voting this best solo game. So you got to take that as a strong recommendation. Like I'd rather that than a Dr. Toy Award, for example, when I'm looking for a more complex game. And you get the benefit of a more familiar world to play in, if that's your preference, compared to Gloomhaven, which is its own unique universe. Mm -hmm. And that was Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. Now, another Middle Earth themed game popped up on a number of best solo game lists. Now, this is another one I haven't personally tried. As I said, I am not a big solo gamer, so I haven't rushed out to try all these. And that is the Lord of the Rings, the card game. So this is a non-collectible card game from Fantasy Flight that many say is the best with one player. Now, this is old. This is very old. This was literally the first living card game. It was the first game to ever trademark LCG. And because of how old it is, the big problem with this game is it's long out of print. Being the first living card game also means they had some things they hadn't quite ironed out. So now with this being out of print could be one of two things, which is why I wanted to include it on the list is you may be able to find it cheap. I know various expansions are dirt cheap because I have been sharing them on tabletop deals quite often. The base game, though, I have no clue. Now, it may mean you won't be able to find this anywhere. Or, more importantly, you might be able to find the base game, but none of the expansions, which are kind of needed to keep it fresh. So this one's kind of a grain of salt recommendation. It sounds cool. We've got people in our chat room right now talking about how freaking good it is. So it's definitely a popular idea out there, but I'm not sure if you'll be able to find it. This is ranked number five in customizable card games on Board Game Geek. Top five. Now, we have never claimed to be at the <laughs> forefront of new hotness, nope. and we stand by that. So that was The Lord of the Rings, the card game. Next, I have Mage Knight, the board game. Now, I'm still completely baffled how a cheap alternative to Warhammer that featured really cheaply pre-painted plastic miniatures and collectible elements. And it was a big war game where you're measuring tapes got turned into the epic fantasy adventure in a box. That's actually a deck builder. Like I, I don't know what this mage knight has to do with the old one. Thankfully nowadays, I think most people have forgotten the old miniature game and everyone only knows this. So it's good. Mage knight is fantastic. Now, similar to Gloomhaven, there's quite a bit of learning curve in this game. This is not an easy game to learn. Um, there is a tutorial in the rule book that's going to take you like three hours to play through. And even then, you're going to be looking up stuff all the time. This is my personal favorite game to play solo of all time so far. Because again, I haven't played all of them. This is the kind of game you sit down and you learn to play through the tutorial. You finish that off and you set up a game and you just leave it somewhere set up. You then go do whatever you cook dinner, you do what you're doing. And then you're like, ah, and then I'm going to go over and I'm going to play a couple turns. I'm going to move a couple hex. I'm going to explore a new territory. I'm going to go to this shop and go shopping. Then you lead it, go, and then you come back again some other time. Now, Mage Knight hits all the fantasy tropes. You're going to build a character. You're going to improve that character. You're exploring the land. You're going to run into monsters. The monsters have layers. There's wizard towers, cities with shopping and more. If there was no Gloomhaven, this would have been my biggest recommendation of the night. Now, Mage Knight is also infinitely replayable due to most of the game being generated randomly as you play. There are also a number of set scenarios you can try and lots of fan content and a new edition that was just released that combines all the existing content into one box. So just to, uh, to sort of put it into perspective, while Gloomhaven is still on BGG, the number one game in all of its categories, Mage Knight sits at a very hefty 25 for strategy yeah. and 26 overall. That's nice that they're that close. <laughs> and that was Mage Knight. All right, next, I wanted to kind of broaden our horizons because many of the games I mentioned kind of have similar themes and similar kind of style of epic battles and that. So I wanted to throw something different in here, and that is Legends of Andor from Cosmos. Now, this is a fantasy-themed cooperative game 
that looks like it's going to be this dice chucking fantasy overland romp with lots of dice rolls and sword swinging, but it's actually more of a puzzle style game where you're trying to optimize your moves and figure out the right order to complete various steps in your quest to be able to complete it. Now, I will say this one is much better with more players. Part of the fun is the negotiating and trying to figure out the puzzles together, and you go take care of that over there while I take care of this over here. It can be played solo. Now, the downfall with Andor is if you're looking to get a year's worth of gameplay out of it, you're going to have to pick up the expansions. There are many. Now, technically, you can replay through the campaign once you've solved each puzzle, but I've got to say they're not as much fun playing through multiple times. Now, that said, the story is good and the game is engaging and it does have a lot of dice rolling. So it's not like it is a puzzle and it's not like playing an escape room game where there's one answer. It, it's more of a, OK, we figured out we definitely need to stop the guys coming in from over here. Well, someone else has to go over here to grab that. Whereas the next time you play the dice go differently, you're like, oh, you know what? The right, right side's perfectly fine. We need to defend this out. So it's it's not a one solution puzzle, but to me, it always felt more like a, a multiplayer puzzle to solve rather than a big epic adventure. Well, puzzles are not everyone's cup of tea, however, so it's just one of the many options we have out there. That was Legends of Andor. Next, we're going to get into a literal dungeon crawling game all about exploring dungeons with lots of miniatures for heroes and bad guys, and that is Sword and Sorcery. Uh, this is generic fantasy themed. Like the name is even generic fantasy themed. It's everything you'd expect from a sword and sorcery game. Uh, this is a cooperative game where you're facing off against the game itself using an in-game AI. So similar to Gloomhaven, no app like Lord of the Rings. Now it's a miniature heavy game, which you know what? If you got a year, maybe you want to pick up miniature painting as well to fill in time between games. Now this one does come strongly recommended as best with two or one. Now, box, the core box, contains one of a three-part adventure, and this is one of those ones where you look it up on Board Game Geek and the list of stuff for this game just keeps going. Now, what I will say is this is much lighter than Gloomhaven. This is more of your fun fantasy romp, uh, lower on the challenging level and the complexity sale. And this is the game I see a lot of people when they're like, whoa, Gloomhaven was too much for me. People are like, oh, try Swords and Wizardry. And then they fall in love with that. So it's a step down on that complexity scale, a little less Euro and a little bit more adventure game, more from the Euro side to the Emirates trash side, as we've talked about before. So as we recently mentioned, miniature painting is its own hobby and not one to be entered into lightly, as it will suck up your time, your money, and possibly your sanity, judging by some of the painters <laughs> I met. However... Some of them may have started before ventilation was as important as it is now. <laughs> but that was Swords and Sorcery. All right, well, I'm certain it won't be enough to keep you busy for a year. I have heard fantastic things about Legacy of Dragonhold from Fantasy Flight Games. With almost everyone who's reviewed this game saying this isn't a multiplayer experience. They forced in multiplayer rules. This is something you can play. It should play on your own. So strongly recommended as a solo experience. Now, this is a fantasy game set in Fantasy Flight's world of Tyranoth. Um, it's designed based on game books, like the old fantasy, fighting fantasy books of old. It's a choose-your-own style adventure game where you do build your own unique hero who will evolve over the story. Now, there's no winner in this game, and it has a focus on playing through an engaging story. Now, the game features six different quest books to play through, which technically can be played through multiple times, trying out different characters from the six different races and the multiple character classes available. Now, I don't think this one was quite the GM-less RPG experience that was kind of sold to people on the box or that Fantasy Flight put out, but I have heard very little negative about this game. Indeed, and while not the fantasy that we've been talking about so far, in a similar vein, for people who do really crave that GM-less RPG experience, I've heard fantastic things about Thousand Year Old Vampire. Okay. Uh, so not as mainstream as Legacy of Dragonhold, but uh, I've heard some great things on, in that GM-less RPG experience, choose your own adventure re vein. But this See, I was... Think the, oh, I think the difference there is Thousand Year Old Vampire is an RPG experience, whereas Dragonhold really is a which way book. 
with your rolling dice to hit and stuff like that. It's more of a, it, it's more of a board game. Now for RPGs, I do recommend you stick around to the end of the list. Cause we do have a fan who stepped up to give us a bunch of RPG recommendations that we'll be getting to after our honorable mentions. But that was legacy of dragon Holt. All right. Next up a game. I knew nothing about until doing research for this topic. Gloom of Killforth. Now, besides the fact they're using that Gloom name, and I'm like, do you really need to use the Gloom name with the Gloom Haven? Are you trying to cash in there? Maybe they came up with the name before that. I don't want to bash on them because, again, I don't actually know this game. This is a fantasy quest game. This came up on many people's top solo game lists. And not just fantasy solo games, but just solo game lists. And is listed as best with one player on Board Game Geek. Now, what looked interesting about this is the entire game is all set in a city called The Sprawl, and you're taking part in a fantasy campaign where it's all dealing with the factions in The Sprawl and things happening on the city streets. I dig that twist from the usual dungeon crawl. Now, this fantasy game tosses out the miniatures and the dungeon tiles and the hex maps and sticks to purely using cards and a few counters for everything. Now, this looks very accessible and feature some really striking artwork. I really like the look of this. Now, just to show that it does have some staying power, it was awarded the best solitaire game of 2017 by the One Player Guild. And possibly the heaviest game on our list as well, just edging above Gloomhaven by like 0.01 on the weight. Wow. <laughs> and that was- I gotta admit, looking at it didn't look that heavy, but who knows? And that was Gloom of Killforth. Next, sticking with the um, high theme, lots of dice, thematic style games, I have a number of games here, actually. The Dungeons & Dragons Adventure System board games. And I do have to thank Bike Guy Dave for reminding me that these can be played solo. Now, the first of these games was Wrath of a Chardalon. There's also Legend of Drizzt, Castle Ravenloft, Temple of Elemental Evil, Tome of Annihilation, Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and coming soon, Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Now, well designed for up to five players, every single one of these games can be played solo. Now, I own the Ravenloft game from the series, and I had some fun with it. But it is very light, simple to learn, uh, some really nice looking unpainted miniatures, map tiles that I like to steal and use my RPGs. Uh, the mechanics feel like you're playing D&D, uh, specifically fourth edition, actually, with you rolling a D20 to hit and having various like daily encounter and at will abilities that you can use. AI system is really simple, but solid, like it works. There was no, there's no arguing over line of sight like you do have in some of the other games we mentioned tonight. Uh, the scenarios, often featured random elements, specifically with the dungeon tiles where you draw randomly, which makes them pretty infinitely replayable. The only reason I don't push these games up like higher on the list, not that they're in any order, but like why I don't recommend these stronger is they don't fit the classification of challenging to me. I found them all pretty simple, easy to win. Um, like, yes, yeah, you had to work at it. They, were, they weren't pushovers, but they just, they were a little simpler than I personally like. So I don't recommend them stronger, but they could be the perfect game, especially if you're into the D&D theme. If you want to explore Waterdeep or check out Salt Marsh or go in the Tomb of Annihilation, this might be a great way to do it. Now for a, I don't know, maybe more robust dungeon crawl. Uh, what about Sanctum as they did release solo rules for this at the uh, beginning of the pandemic. So I wouldn't really call Sanctum a robust dungeon crawl. Uh, not because, not just because there's no dungeon, so it's not really a dungeon crawl at all. Uh, it's more of a dice chucking euro. Uh, it's all about being able to collect the right monsters that give you the best odds of rolling the right dice rolls and then defeating them to equip the right skills and equipment so that you can modify your dice rolls more. And then it's about destroying wave after wave. There's no exploration. There's no choice on what path to go. You just follow a linear path and you move up to the next available spot and eventually you get to a boss fight. That said, it's a solid game. I dig Sanctum. It's a fun game. But to me, it's, it doesn't even feel like a fantasy adventure game, even though being themed on like Diablo. The problem and what had me not put this on the list is I have not heard very good things about the solo play that basically it works, but... I'd rather play with friends from pretty much everyone I know who tried it. So while it's awesome, CG put out solo rules for those of us stuck at home. I don't see it as recommending it for solo play, especially over the other games on the list. 
though it might be worth a try, especially if you already have it. Why not try it solo? Fair enough. Now that was the D and D adventure system games and potentially sanctum. Now sticking with similar games, I want to finish off the main list with something very light, very quick, and very easy. Just in case I read Candace's question totally wrong or totally misjudged their gaming experience. My final game on this list is Castle Panic. This is a tower defense game that I honestly usually recommend is a great cooperative game for kids and parents to play together. It is that light. While it's probably not going to keep anyone interested for over a year, uh, it's, it's a good, nice, fun diversion taking well under an hour with one player. Now, there are some expansions out there to keep things interesting if you do get tired of fighting off the same monsters over and over again. And personally, I think you can never go wrong with tower defense games. But that was Castle Panic. Next, I have, I don't remember how many because I made the notes earlier today, five, maybe four or five honorable mentions. These, I will note why they're not on the main list when I get to them, but unlike our usual, it's not just games I haven't played because, well, the main list had some games I haven't played. These are mainly ones that didn't quite fit the theme or may or may not. Starting with Seventh Continent. This is the solo game highest up on my personal wish list. While you can play up to four players, everyone I've seen talking about Seventh Continent says it's a one-player experience, maybe two. Now, like Gloomhaven, it offers an epic ongoing campaign that takes hours and hours to finish over many sessions that you can start and stop whenever you want. Now, not on the main list, because I honestly have no idea how many fantasy elements Seventh Continent has. Now, it's set in the early 20th century where you are in a shipwreck and you're stranded on a desert island. Um, I know there are some fantastical elements to be found. And I noticed that Board Game Geek tagged it sci-fi. So I, having not played it, and I don't want to spoil it, actually, in a way, too, because it is a kind of a discovery game. I have no clue if this qualifies as a fantasy game. But I have heard that Seventh Continent is one of the best solo experiences in board game card game form. And that was Seventh Continent. Next, something to replace the long out of print Lord of the Rings card game, and that is Arkham Horror, the card game. So again, I don't know if you consider the Cthulhu mythos to be fantasy. To me, I think it's horror. Is it a mix of both? Are your elder gods from the distant stars sci-fi? It's definitely not normal, so it's got to be fantasy of some type. So this is why this game got tossed under honorable mentions as well as the fact I haven't played it myself. But everyone I know and every podcast I've listened to has said this is one of the best solo experiences out there. That If you want a solo living card game, Arkham Horror is the way to go. Now, again, this is a non-collectible game with plenty of expansions to keep anyone busy for a year or more with new seasons still coming out. Now, again, this looks like the game that replaced Lord of the Rings for Lord of the Rings fans. Lord of the Rings, the card game fans. And that was Arkham Horror, the card game. Now, speaking of mythos-themed games, I also want to suggest Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Now, similar to Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth that made the main list, this is an app-based game. It's a cooperative game where the app plays your adversary. And what I dig about this app, and Journeys in Middle-Earth does the same thing, is you put in what expansions you own, and you'll choose and pick parts from each one to build a unique experience each time. So it'll randomize what's in the core box. You buy just one expansion, and it adds tons more replayability. Now, this one I have played. I really dig Mansion Madness Second Edition. A real mix of exploration, puzzle solving, and dice chucking combat. I have friends who absolutely love this game, though I will admit I have not tried it solo. I have played two player and four. And that was Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Next, I have Shadows of Brimstone. This is a big, epic miniature dungeon crawling game with tons of crunch it's almost more of an rpg with the amount of stuff going on it reminds me of the classic games workshop game mordheim actually now the initial premise of this game is old west right you start off here in the old west you're exploring a mine but that mine features gateways to any number of other worlds and dimensions each of these worlds can be explored through expansion content they include fantasy, sci-fi, time travel, horror, and more. Now, the base game has one portal that leads you to the plains of Targa, 
which is an ancient fantasy frozen city. So we got fantasy right in the core box. Now, Shadows also features a lot of random elements, including when you're trying to put out your, uh, like, generate quests at the beginning of the game. So each of these settings can be explored multiple times, making the game very replayable. Now, this is another one like Swords and Wizardry that's very miniature heavy that could lead to taking part in the whole miniature painting hobby, though that's not necessarily required. Honestly, of all the games on this list tonight, this is the one I'm both most curious about and want to try and most intimidated by. There is just so much out there for this game and hearing podcasters, specifically the secret cabal warning people about the level of detail and fiddliness in this game, where every time they talk about it, they're basically apologizing for it. Like we love it, but Oh, this, 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 but we love it. Like, it's just one of those games. This is the game that I think if Sean was in Windsor, we'd play together regularly and we'd be painting our own miniatures and customizing them and doing all the stuff we did with the old games workshop stuff. Yeah. I have to say uh, the shadows of brimstone city of the ancients, one of the yep. three core boxes uh, was just revised in 2020 and is currently sitting at an 8.9. Yeah. On, but uh, I said, it's, it looks good. Yeah. It looks really good. So that was Shadows of Brimstone and all the various 215 yes, so different uh, component things. You can tell that game came out once Kickstarter had hit. <laughs> Finally, I want to finish off with a game from Portal Games, Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Now, this one has a theme very similar to Seventh Continent, but I think it has less fantasy elements. And to be honest, I don't know if it has any except for the fact it's the Cursed Islands. This is more of a game about surviving against the elements and local animals, keeping yourself fed, and more about that than exploring. Now, I have heard many wonderful things about this game and many people sharing great sounding moments. Like, oh, remember that time we played Robinson Crusoe and I got bit by a spider? And then it was like weeks later, we were about to get on the boat and all of a sudden my leg gave way. Like, like people tell epic stories playing this game. This one is supposed to be just as good at every player count, including one, and came up on almost every single best solo game list I saw while doing research for this topic. This is one I need to try out. I, I remember watching Big J and his best friend trying to play this at the Green Bean Cafe downtown and just being overwhelmed. But every time I asked him, how's it going? Like, this is awesome, even though they're flipping through 100 books and trying to figure out what was going on. I really want to try this game out. Again, no clue on the fantasy elements. I, I really think it's not. It's more of a survival-based game. But it, it's called Cursed. Maybe there's some kind of voodoo curses or something in it. Well, that was Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Well, that's it for our list of challenging solo games with fantasy themes. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. I saw lots of awesome stuff going on in the chat room, and we will address that. Um, but first, I want to get to something else. So for this topic discussion and recommendations, we do mainly board game content. And so when someone sends me a question, I just default thinking about board games. We do also talk about role-playing games, and I reread Candace's question, I'm like, oh, she might have meant RPGs or she might have wanted either. So, well, many of the games we mentioned do feature RPG elements and leveling up characters. There's nothing there I would consider a full role playing game. So after realizing this, I thought about putting in some solo RPGs like I know they're a thing. I know that solo RPGs exist, but to be honest, it's a form of tabletop gaming I have not tried at all. Well, I have at least played some solo board games and I've played many of these games with multiple players so I can at least know how they play. I've never tried a solo RPG. And to be honest, I would have to do a lot of research. Like the only solo RPG I know off the top of my head is The Beast. And that's one we're not going to be talking about on this show probably ever. So that one's not going to be on this list due to the adult content in it. Well, Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron Jeff Seuss to the rescue. Jeff is our resident indie RPG fan. And mm -hmm. when we mentioned this was the topic we were going to be covering tonight, Jeff Jeff jumped into our Discord to provide us a list of his popular 
Solo Fantasy Epics RPG Edition. And I just want to point out, I have not read this list until now, so they did not color any yeah. of my earlier comments. Which is why I mentioned that we were going to get to this. <laughs> First up on his list is 1,000-Year-Old Vampire. Uh, followed by Iron Sworn, probably, probably the single most popular. Mm-hmm. Mythic, more mature, more popular before Iron Sworn hit the scene. A Torch in the Dark, which is a Forged in the Dark game. Quill with the White Box add-on. Scarlet Heroes. Disciples of Bone and Shadow. Delve, which is map drawing. And Terminus, Wretched and Alone Hack with an epic fantasy theme. So those are the solo RPGs that Jeff has seen people talking about the most. He did have some additional thoughts to share on some of these. Now, Iron Sworn is mentioned at least 10 times more often than any of the others. Yeah. Now, while Mythic is mentioned in a lot of archaeological Reddit threads, he hasn't seen it mentioned in solo RPG Discord land in quite a while. Yeah. Now, the reason, the reason I found this earlier, Thousand Year Old Vampire is just gorgeous, dripping with theme, and probably doesn't fit epic fantasy, but it deserves consideration anyway as the most popular one to be purchased in fancy hardcover and flaunted rather than downloaded as a PDF. Nice. I have to say when I did hop on the website and check this out earlier during my researches, wow, is it a yeah. beautiful book. And then Wretched and Alone is a very popular system for solo role playing and on gets mentioned often. Terminus fits the theme, but I haven't heard much about it specifically, he says. Now for people who are I uh, heard that and I'm like, oh, this Jeff guy sounds awesome. I want to hear more from Jeff. Jeff has actually just started a tabletop RPG TikTok channel where I can promise you he's never going to be on there louding Dungeons and Dragons. Jeff is our, as I like to call them um, affectionately, our hippie indie storytelling past the stick game uh, fan. Who, who's definitely into that side of gaming much more than the traditional role-playing games. So I do know he's also a fan of like Seven Seas and John Wick. So it's not all newfangled hippie shite, but he, he is into some interesting games, we will say. So I dropped a link to that. We'll throw it in the show notes as well. So there you have a number of solo RPGs that sound like they're worth checking out. So thanks so much, Jeff, for giving us these suggestions. Aren't our fans awesome? Indeed they are. And it started early in this chat yes. with Ryan uh, talking about uh, suggesting Descent 2nd Edition or the new Descent Legends in the Dark for okay. solo. 2nd Edition Descent, not popular solo. It can be done. It's done through an app and the app gets repetitive. That is what I saw in my research. I have Descent 2nd Edition. Again, I played it. I personally don't think it's it's it uh, descent first edition feels dated at this point. Descent second edition feels a little dated. I, it's still probably a solid game, but it does not come as recommended as solo. So it's playable solo, but no one seemed to recommend it that way. Now I have no opinion on the new descent except man, it looks good. It literally hit shelves this last week. Uh, Fantasy Flight is not someone we work with, so we don't tend to get previews of their stuff or anything. What I've seen of it looks great. I have no clue. Um, I do know Tom Vassell cut it up and a lot of people are now backing away from it. So they got some really nasty press from Tom, supposedly. I don't even think it was nasty, but he didn't like it. And I am seeing a lot of people going, thanks, Tom, for saving me 150 bucks. So we'll see if this one even lasts. I, I don't know if it can be played solo. Like I said, it came out this week. And as we said many times in the show, we are not all about the new hotness. <laughs> uh, it is listed as uh, one to four on BGG. Oh, yes. So for, it can be for played. What so- for what it's worse. It says best four, but again, it just came out. So those yeah, rankings mean out. almost nothing. Uh, one thing Razul notes early again, early on in our chat, uh, that Gloomhaven is a game that grows on you. After the first scenario, he was, wasn't was sure about it, but by yeah. the third, they couldn't wait for more. Oh, I did watch our original Gloomhaven stream. So it should still be out there somewhere. We lost the first scenario four times, I think, in a row and had a big debate about how is playing on easy giving up and are, are we lesser gamers for doing so? Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I still enjoyed it. But I think a lot of that, if I wasn't playing with the Anatorian Cat, we might have given up on Gloomhaven. Or if I had spent 100 and 
50 or whatever I paid at the time to get that. It was definitely frustrating. Oh, we didn't start right off the bat. I didn't realize we didn't start right off the bat. Um, didn't I started yeah. streaming? Oh. So we, we were playing a bit before our first stream. So yeah, the, the, the initial experience with Gloom Maven was rough. The thing is, I knew that. I saw board game geek threads, people talking about it like, holy cow, how do I win this game? And the biggest trick is make sure you're following the rules because they're easy to mess up. And number two, remember you can discard cards instead of taking damage. Those are my two biggest tips for playing Gloomhaven. And if you do the first one right, the game gets much easier because people screw up stuff in those game rules all the time. Uh, next up, I got a comment from Ryan. Uh, will He would also recommend Defenders of the Realm, though it might be hard to come by now. Uh, it is a 2010 game, but it was replaced by Defenders of the Last Stand. Yeah, no one likes Defenders of the Last Stand. I don't know why. But Defenders of the Last Stand did not go over well. So is Defenders around playable solo? That one I I, I know yeah, of both the game. Are, both are playable solo. Solo? Okay. Uh, they're both they're both one to four. They're both rated as best four. Interestingly, Defenders of the uh Last Stand has a better rating than Defenders of the Realm. Well, that's weird. I, <laughs> I have heard no one talk about it. So Defenders of the Realm's fantasy with uh Larry Elmore that basically uses the pandemic mechanics with boss monsters trying to come in in the middle. So some tower defense. Really interesting game. Uh I didn't love it. That that's a best guess. I, I, it reminded me of pandemic, and everyone knows my thoughts on pandemic. It just <laughs> to me, it wasn't. There was a lot of quarterbacking, which I guess solo wouldn't be a problem. Fair enough. So I did not see it come up on other people's list, but we'll definitely toss that in the show notes. Uh, going through lists here, I, I, I stopped copying things over, so I've. Uh... So yeah, the the question did want fantasy, so you wouldn't want Defenders of the Last Stand. That's a right. that's a yeah. sci fi. It's wasteland. Uh, a good uh, discussion came up about uh, co-op games in general, a little bit uh, outside of what we were talking about tonight, mm -hmm. but some good discussion about how a lot of co-op games are a little more solo than people would like. Yes. Uh, as uh, the talk of, uh, sorry, which game, uh, sorry, Lord of the Rings living card game is so good because it has a lot of what uh, Pickle Help describes as their favorite camp mechanic, which is take this as opposed to take okay. that. So yep. you're helping each other out in, in actually cooperating as opposed to, uh, you know, just sort of playing along next to each other and helping each other incidentally. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I remember the the Warhammer Fantasy role play uh, adventure card game, which I don't know if you could play solo. I, I don't recommend that to anyone because there's only four scenarios and they lost the license. So it's such a dead end product. I never recommend it. But in that you had four or five cards with your actions on them. And one of them was specifically help the other players. And the way it worked is you couldn't use the same card in turn. So eventually you would have to use that card. So not only are you encouraged to help each other, you're forced to, even if you have those players who are trying to play selfish. And I really like that. And we also talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games from IDW and with the sharing dice system in that. I love that for cooperative games. Right. Uh, a couple more suggestions from Ryan. He wonders if uh, One Deck Dungeon com comes in as challenging. Uh, the problem, I thought it didn't seem epic to me. It seemed too short. That's why I did not put it on the list. Again, I haven't played it, but doing the research today, I did look at a number of solo games and that one I did not put. Like I literally, I just start typing one deck and it shows up because I was trying to see how long it was. And I'm like, oh, it's 45 minutes. But like, that's a quick filler game to me. And unless like you want to play hundreds of games over a year, <laughs> that like to me, that just seemed now challenging. I don't know. Maybe it's really hard to win that 45 minute game. Right. I don't know the game that well, but the complexity rating on this was lower. Um, it did win the 2016 Golden Geek Best Solo Board Game. Or sorry, nominated, nominated. Uh, so definitely a solid fantasy game. Maybe it should have been on the list. Just didn't seem epic enough. Like like less than half an hour a game just seemed kind of like filler. But then I threw on Castle Panic. So I guess I probably should have one deck dungeon on the list. So my bad. If I'm going to put on Castle Panic, this should have been on the list. Uh, the next thing is he was wondering about Dice Throne Adventures. And now this does. Dice Throne itself is not a single player say, game. Dice Throne's but not. Dice Throne Adventures, okay. the expansion for it, makes it a uh, guess, best came, at one to two. Came out in the last year. 19 or 2020. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a pandemic. Sorry, a little too new hotness for us. A little too new hotness for us. But uh, so, yeah, that's was something worth looking at possibly is Dice Throne with the Dice Throne Adventures expansion. 
Fair enough. Good ratings. Really good ratings. Yeah, no, absolutely. And wow, uh, oh, 900 ratings and it's got an 8.5. So, uh, some uh, Razzle was mentioning Sleeping Gods is a good game, uh, which has an odd 60 to 1200 minute playtime. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a typo or if that's a that really even long yet? game. That that was a recent Kickstarter. Is that even in people's hands yet? Uh, that I can't. Uh... That I can't say. It's... It is It is another seventh continent, or <laughs> um, what do you call it? You're lost on a ship, and you're exploring. What's with these 1920s? You're lost somewhere, and you have to explore. It's a campaign game. You play as long as you want. When you're ready to take a break, you mark your progress in your journal, making it easier to enter into the game. Uh, so, yeah, this is another... another um, like I said, reminds me of Seventh Continent, reminds me of Robinson Crusoe a bit. Looks epic, but I didn't know it was out. Hit stores early July. Oh, so last Very month. Yeah, Come yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about games from 19... From, yeah, we're, we're talking from about nine-year-old games here. Um, there aren't... Uh, oh, it's Red see. Raven, though. Okay, now I'm interested. <laughs> that that That's Ryan Lockett. Is Ryan Lockett designed it? Yeah, Ryan Lockett designed it. So that's like the designer of Near, Near and Far, Above and Below, Charterstone. Probably awesome. So yes, probably belongs on the list. <laughs> but uses a spiral book. It looks really cool. 1920 steamships, though. Razzle a... Tavo 2 says, it's worth looking into, trust me. Yeah, no, it looks good. There we go, 1920, so just like Scythe. Yeah, um... <laughs> exactly. What's with the Roaring 20s in board games? We're going to be able to do a, like the best board game set in 1920s. There you go. It's weird. Uh... It's a, no one's noticed this. Everyone noticed Mars and Zombies. Did anyone notice there's a ridiculous number of games coming out set in the 1920s? Well, it is the 2020s. I mean, it's 100 years, so not oh, surprising, yeah. Maybe really. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. It's 100 just, years ago. Where everyone wants, the, everyone wants the 2020s to be the roaring 20s again. Um, so we can get lost. That's, that's, <laughs> and have mechs. We want our steampunk. Um, that's about all we've got going on all right. for right now, though, I think. Hello, today we're going to be taking a look at Circle of Six, a quick-to-learn set collection card game. Before we begin, we must point out that the designer of Circle of Six, who we both know personally, sent us a copy of Circle of Six to check out. So Circle of Six was designed by a friend of mine, Robert M. Everson, and published by the company he does editing work for, Encoded Designs. Robert, or Bob, or Old Man Logan, is also one of the hosts of the excellent Misdirected Mark Gaming podcast, which I have been a long-term fan of, and is how I met Bob. Now, Bob's been playtesting and showing off Circle of Six for a number of years, hoping to find a publisher. In 2020, after having no luck, he decided to release it to the public, print-on-demand, through drive through cards. Now, Circle of Six plays two to six players, with a round of the game taking under 15 minutes easily. Now, a full game, which is played until someone wins three, five, or seven rounds, will take significantly longer. This game currently has a price on drive through cards of $14.95 US. And I should note that we should uh, point out that the Misdirected Mark show is also a patron of the show. Yes, that is true. Thank you. Uh, now, with a light game combined with 15-minute rounds, it's a great choice for a relaxing game whether you want to talk and get distracted during or between the yes. rounds of the game. Now, the goal of a round of Circle of Six is to collect a set of cards numbered one through six. These can be your cards or your opponents, and you're doing this by placing cards into the circle or manipulating the marker and collecting cards from the circle. For a look at the quality of the cards and how they were shipped, check out our Circle of Six unboxing video on YouTube. So my copy of Circle of Six came in a clear plastic card case. Now the cards are nice playing card quality. You get six circle cards numbered one through six, two marker cards, only one you use during the game. There's two different options. You have six player ID cards and then six decks, which contain 14 cards each, which is the numbers one through six, twice and wild cards, two wild cards. Now, in addition to being color coded, the individual decks feature unique symbology to assist with any vision problems players may have, like color blindness. So, and they are, they're a, they're a paper card. What sort of finish on them? Uh, should they be sleeved for heavy use or, or will they hold up? So the, the technical term is U.S. playing card quality. 
So they are bicycle cart quality, okay. which I, they're not plastic, but they're plasticized. Like whatever, whatever standard playing cards are made of that's, it's okay. somewhat water resistant, but right. not waterproof. <laughs> now what's notably missing from this plastic card case are the rules for how to play the game. The only place you can actually get a copy of the circle of six rules is from the drive through cards page for the game. Now I did point out to Bob that he may want to do something about this, whether it's include the rules on it mean, with the cards on cards, or even better, in my opinion, just simpler is put a QR code to where you can download the rules. Now the card set did, I did mention has a two marker cards. Well, there is a bonus marker card. You have one that lays flat that you can put on the cards, or there's one that just with a pair of scissors, you can cut and make a little standy which you can move around, which you end up turning instead of flipping while you play. All right. Well, how about you give us an overview of how to play Circle of Six? So you start by creating a ring with the six circle cards, or I should say a circle of six cards, so that they're in numerical order going clockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six. You're then randomly going to cover one of those with the marker card. Now, each player grabs one of the unique decks or sorry, they're not unique, unique colored decks. They're all the same decks. Uh, and the player ID card of that color and place the player ID card in front of them. Now, there's a quick card draw to determine starting player. After that, you shuffle your decks and then discard the top card face down to the middle of the circle of six and then draw a second card into your hand. Now, discarding one card per deck makes it so that anyone doing card counting doesn't have mm -hmm. perfect information. Something I think is very important in these style of games. Now, a round of Circle of Six is played until one player is able to collect a full set of cards numbered one through six, or everyone runs out of cards, plays their last card from their deck. Now, each turn, you're going to draw a card. You then take any of your cards that are still face up in the circles, face up on top of the circle cards since your last turn, and put them in your scoring action or scoring area. You're then going to take one action. The actions are add a card to the circle. Play a card from your hand onto the matching circle card. Note, you can't play on the one that is covered by the marker. Now, this card is placed on top of any other cards that are already there. The other option is to move that marker card. You're going to discard a card from your hand, and you're going to move the marker in the direction shown on it, a number of spots equal to the value of the card. So if you discard a three, you move it three spots. You're then going to take the top card from that spot and put it in your scoring pile, and then put the marker onto the spot where you took the card, but flip it over. So some real exciting waiting and watching, potentially with wincing and grunting sound effects, inset with brief moments of lunging with joy or crushing despair. Yeah, this is definitely one of those games where like, oh, you took my spot, or oh, I, oh, it's almost there, it's almost there, it just gets to me one more turn, I'm getting my life, oh, and someone moved the dang marker. That is the kind of game this is. Now, wild cards, you got two of them in your deck, they can be played on any circle card, then count as having the value of that card for the rest of the round. Wild cards can also be used to move the marker, but here you discard every card in the circle except those that are under the marker, and then flip the marker over. That's a pretty heavy-duty action for a wild card. Yeah, the wild cards in this game can be powerful. Now, I mentioned flipping the marker card. That's because it's two-sided. Now, no one can play on the, the, the spot the marker is on, and the marker has arrows on it point either clockwise or counterclockwise. So every time someone moves the marker, it's going to flip over. So it's going to go clockwise, then counterclockwise, then clockwise, then counterclockwise, back and forth. So every time the marker moves, it gets flipped. So it is possible to bounce the marker back and forth between two spots on the circle then? Yes, like I can move it three, and if the next person moves it three, it's going to go back to where it just was. Now, me moving back and forth is going to really depend on the other players not doing much. So that's probably going to be a little unlikely, especially at the highest player count. Now, you also have a player ID card. What this does is just shows everyone what color you are for one, but then tells you where to put your discarded cards and your scored cards. Um, honestly, you can do either way. Like, this is two-sided, so you can go left, right, or right, left, which I thought was interesting, though it does make it a little confusing during play going, yeah, those are your discards or your scored cards. Kind of, I, I suggest you have everyone place it the same way. Now, as the game stands, the scoring cards are onto the side and there's no way to like organize them. You just make a pile of them, you spread them out, you splay them, which is fine for cards number one to six. Where there's a problem is wild cards. So remember when you play a wild card, it takes on the number you played it on, but you have to remember what that wild card is. Um, 
often this is easy to do. Like if you have a four and a six and you wild card a five, you just put it in between those and it's obvious, but sometimes a little harder. So you might want to use a marker of some sort, like a D6. Now the designer is working on a more suitable solution for this that will be included in the game. And to be fair, I doubt anyone Bob has any regular contact <laughs> with doesn't have a D6 at hand at any moment. Very true. Technically, you you could need what six player twelve d sixes if you happen well by then you'd have won the round I would hope so I, I guess if they all twelve could be ones you might need a lot of d sixes but yeah you'll need some way to organize those wild cards so the round ends when you've got a full set in your scoring section of a full set of cards one two three four five six or when everyone's played their last card now if the round ends due to running out of cards. This is when you go to those cards you discarded at the beginning of the round. Starting with the first player and going clockwise, you're going to draw one of those face down cards from the center of the circle and move the marker, removing anything it lands on from play. If a wild card is drawn from the center, all cards are removed from play. And you do this for each player. So all you're basically doing is removing cards from the circle. Then everyone collects any cards left face up of theirs and score them, which can cause someone to win the round. But don't fret, someone will win even if no one got them all. Yes, so collecting a full set, either during the round or after, gives you one point. If two players complete a set at the same time, the player whose set contains the most of their own color wins, with a further tiebreaker being the total number of cards collected. Now, if no one completes a set, the point just goes to the player who collected the most cards using those same tiebreakers. Now, when a round's completed, you remove all the cards, return them to their players. The only thing that stays out is, well, the circle would still be there and the marker stays in its last position. Now, a full game of Circle of Six, as written, is played three points for a short game, five points for a normal game, or seven points for a long game. And you can only get a maximum of one point for per round. Mm -hmm. So playing to seven points can take a while unless one person is just really good. <sighs> and really lucky. <laughs> Now that we know how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about Circle of Six. So I first got to play Circle of Six at Breakout Con up in Toronto, Ontario, where I met a number of folks involved in the Gnome Stew blog, the Misdirected Mark podcast, and the Encoded Designs publisher. This is a group that likes to be known as the Gem Team, Gnome Stew, Misdirected Mark, Encoded, with the designer of the game, Bob, being one of those awesome people I got to meet. I then got to play a few more rounds of it at Queen City Conquest, and right from the start, I thought Bob had a really solid game here. Now, when we were playing, we were playing prototype copies, but they were basically what we're playing now. Now, Deanna also played it and liked it, and you also got to play it at QCC, didn't you? I did, indeed. Dee and I sat down while you were playing an RPG and played a few rounds. Uh, what I don't recall, though, is doing much, if any, scoring. Mm -hmm. We were just playing through hands and enjoying that sort of single round experience uh, of, of, you know, hey, I won this hand. Hey, you won that hand. Yeah, uh, something to do between games, something to do to kill time. Yeah. Now, having already experienced the game and enjoyed it, I was really excited to hear that Bob has finally released it, right? He released the Kraken. He put it out print on demand. And I was even more excited when Bob's like, hey, do you want a copy to check out? And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What I was surprised when it showed up is that it was the game we played. Like, it looks identical. At, to the game I played at cons. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It just, I didn't expect it. Like I expected the production copy to look different than the prototype copy. Now the game does feature solid graphic design. It's in general, very easy to read across the table, though I do wish there was a bit more contrast, maybe a black outline on the things, especially the yellow, especially if there's any glare. Cause again, these are those slightly shiny cards. The, the colors could stick out a bit more. The design works like it's easy to tell a difference between one through six and the wild cards are very easy. I just, I don't know, maybe it's just false expectation. I just thought the production version of 606 would pop more than the prototype. Now, to be fair, this is more or less what you get with most drive through card products, unless you go for a uh, custom tuck box or, you know, something else. Uh, this is certainly less of a product than you would expect to see on a retail shelf. Yeah. Now, the biggest disappointment with the set of cards from drive through Cards, though, was that lack of instructions with the physical product. Now, I know the game. I played it at a couple different cons, but even I needed a reminder for how to play. For someone picking up this game who doesn't know the game and has never seen it before, I think they're going to be disappointed and troubled by the lack of instructions. 
Well, yes, there is a link to the rules right on the drive through page. It's not really obvious, and there's nothing in the description that says, if you order this, be sure to download the rules. It just needs to be more out there so people know. Indeed, most people don't expect to go hunting for rules. They're in the box, or at least you're directed straight to them right there in the box. Well, mm -hmm. sure, they're simple. I mean, it, it's, an, it's an easy game. The disconnect between ordering and receiving the print-on-demand product is enough to make it easy to forget that you might mm -hmm. have seen that link when you bought the game. And honestly, I Googled it, and they did not come up. And I ended up going, well, these are from drive through Cards, right? Because I didn't buy it off drive through Cards. I had to go look, and then eventually I found it on drive through Cards. I'm like, oh, there are the rules. Okay. Now, sadly, along with this, once you do find the rules, they're honestly not very clear. Now, most of the gem team are RPG folks who also play some board games. And it seems obvious to me that the rules for Circle of Six were written and edited people who are more comfortable doing RPG rules than board game rules. Now, I'm not going to get into details here because mainly I did get a hold of Bob and I sent him a pretty extensive list of questions and potential edits. And he is already working on updating the rules. So hopefully by the time you check out the rules, this won't be a problem at all. And we have spoken in length about the importance of clear rules in making a game really work. Yeah. Now, my only other complaint about this game is the wild cards. Um, the fact they take on the number where they're placed is fine. But having to track that in some way, once you score them, can be a problem. After our last play, I'm just going to make sure to have these six dice around. So I can just mark one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, other things we've thought of is to make some kind of play mat for each player. Even if it's just a sheet of paper, it says one, two, three, four, five, six on it. So you have somewhere to place your cards. Or if you're not playing with a full player count of six, use some of the other cards as placeholders or possibly use playing cards like one, two, three, four, five of aces just to be used it. Or use the cards of another player color that's not in the game to replace the wild card. So when you score a wild card, just swap them out. It just, it needs something. Again, it's an easy problem for players to solve, but most people who buy a game don't want to solve problems. They just want to play the game. Yeah. Now, in all, I end up finding these problems really disappointing because Circle of Six as a game is still a lot of fun. It's a light, casual, easy to teach game that I think is perfect for what Sean talked about earlier and how he played it. A social game night where it's the kind of game you don't have to play a lot of attention to, where you're just hanging out and chatting with friends and you happen to be playing games. That's also how I was introduced to Social Six. Circle of Six, in a social setting where we were talking about our con experiences and getting to know each other and just happen to be playing Bob's new game while we were playing, while we were chatting and getting to know each other. This is where I think Circle of Six still shines. With that, there is an up depth here for people who want to take things more seriously, who are taking the time to do card counting and remembering that you obviously only have a three in your deck and there's two cards left, so you're going to have to put that three up. There, you can play the game at that level. Now, just like Sean, when I played Circle of Six, we never kept track of points. And honestly, I didn't realize that was part of the game. We played it like I play Concept or many people play Code Names or other party games. We just toss the scoring out, play a few rounds in a row, not really keeping track of who was winning each round and who wasn't, and just stop and we get tired of the game. Or well, like I said, this was at a con. So we play until someone had a game they had to go to to run or someone had to run off to use the washroom. We never track points at all. And I still think Circle of Six works really well this day. What I question is playing the game for a set number of points as indicated. Like the default is you play until one player has five points. This could be 25 rounds of Circle of Six. That's a lot of Circle of Six. I like the game, but that's more than I'd ever want to play in one sitting. And even playing to three points, unless you get someone who kind of runs away with it, even that could take a long time. And it's easy enough just to play until you're done playing, and whoever has the most points wins or ties. Or ties. Or sit there and go, you know, we're going to play for an hour, and then whoever has tied points, they play themselves, and the next person to win takes it all. Something like that. Well, the rules could use an update. And yes, the POD file should be updated to somehow include those rules or at least a link to those rules. I think Circle of Six is a very solid light card game. Well, it does have take that elements. It just never feels nasty. It's just kind of part of the game. What it really gives me a feel of is playing games like Uno. 
though a more deep and complex and honestly more interesting Uno. But like you don't usually get mad at someone for turning the turn direction in Uno or for making you draw plus four, especially when using the real rules where you don't stack eight plus fours at once. Indeed, I think with the right polish and push behind it, I don't see any reason this couldn't be a large mass market game. I, I think you're right. Like, if you're looking for a light, easy to teach card game, something that's perfect to play in a social setting where you want to hang out with friends but also play a game, check out Circle of Six. Now, a shout out I don't usually do on this show, and I don't know how many publishers are listening to me right now, but if we do have any publishers who listen, if you're looking for a light party game to add to your catalog, I know Bob would love to show you Circle of Six, and I would love to see a professionally produced, designed, developed version of this game out there on the market. And like Sean said, I can see this on shelves on the hanging rack next to Uno and Duo and Wizard and all the other mass market, not just poker like card games. Indeed. Well, that's it for our look at Circle of Six. I invite you to read more about this easy to learn set collection game in the review section of our blog over at Tabletop Bellhop. Dot com. Join us for a look at Aroma, a scent-based board game. Let's start with a thank you to Organic Aromas for sending us a review copy of their game. Aroma was designed by Odd Hackwelder, who also did the artwork for the game. It was published by Organic Aromas on in 2020, originally only available on their website, but now also on Amazon. Aroma features four different mini games in the box, each of which takes under an hour, with some taking significantly less than that. Now, the game requires either two, three, or four players, each of the games. Each should, these players should be at least 14 years of age due to this game coming with concentrated essential oils, which could cause a reaction if ingested or put directly on the skin. Aroma has an MSRP, I guess it's MSRP, they are selling it for $58 US. And we'll talk more about the price point of that game later on. Now, each of the four games of Aroma is, of course, based around using your sense of smell to try to identify the various essential oils in the game. Now, the games include Discover, which is kind of like a smell-based game of Liar's Dice, Survive, which is a last man standing game where players' scents represent their health, Resolve, which has all players trying to identify the same scents one after another, and Collect, where players are trying to collect the scents of one of the four scent types. Now, each of these games also features a unique mini game for determining start player, which I thought was a cool touch. I do have to give a thumbs up for gamifying start player and not mm -hmm. using something like the last person who sniffed a lilac plant or something equally annoying to me. <laughs> Now, for a look at what you get with a copy of Aroma, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, I get into a full summary of all the components over on the blog, but for here, I just want to feature a couple specific things. So the rules are a fold-out sheet with lots of artwork and examples. Um, I do feel they may have been translated to English just because they have some odd word usage. It's not enough that we couldn't figure out how to play or what we were doing, but a couple of things was you had to read a couple of times. It's just things weren't quite in the right order or use some obscure words. Now, while the founder of the company is apparently Chinese, uh, the company is fully U.S. based. Yeah. Now, other components include thick cardboard boards, one for each of the four scent types, reference cards listing all the scents. A business card for each scent included in the game, wooden pieces in four colors, including a large token and cubes and a number of aroma tokens in four colors that list all the different scents. Then, of course, are the essential oils themselves. These come in four uh, thin card trays with five scent bottles each in each of the trays. There are four different categories of scents, citrus, trees, floral, and plants. And there are five scents for each category, and I'm not listening to those here. Now, the small scent bottles use a roller system that prevents any leakage, so you don't have to worry about, like, capping them up good. Um, to use these, there are also a number of paper strips included, and when you're meant to smell a scent, what you should be doing is shaking the, the bottle, then rolling some of the scent onto the paper to smell. Note, these oils are strong. The scents from them will fill the room you are playing in. If you or anyone in the area is sensitive to scents, you just want to avoid this game. 
Now, this should also be considered when playing in a public place. And remember, you should not be placing the oils on your skin ever. From the company's website directly, strictly speaking, a certified aromatherapist would recommend that you use eye and skin protection at all times when handling essential oils. Essentials can be toxic, too. They can be harmful to skin, mucous membranes, and the eyes. Please be extremely cautious when using and handling the oils. It is also possible to breathe too much essential oils. Essential oils are very corrosive to almost anything, including plastic, paper, fabric, wood, and paint. It will harm almost anything you put it on, and in a relatively short period of time, too, so be careful. Always avoid any drop of oil getting on your things. If you spill, this is okay, but wipe up the oil correctly with a cloth or tissue, and wipe the area down with a damp towel or something to get all the essential oil off. Essential oils are dangerous to kids, children, pregnant women, the elderly, and potentially pets and other animals as well. Please be prudent, use in moderation, and be cautious when using essential oils around them. Always consult a professional as well. Hey, you don't expect your board game to need Wemyss symbols on it. Not that it does. And this warning is not included in the box. There is a small warning on the box, and that does also highlight the Almost English, like I said, there's a translation thing there. It's just the, the way the wording is done. So yes, um, nope, these are not condensed, like they're condensed, but they are watered down. So I think that's supposed to be for a non-diluted essential oil. What these do come with, they are watered down, and I don't have the rules in front of me, but it tells you what they're watered down with. I actually there's cover that some later. some medium added. I do cover that later. Uh, okay. Now that we know what you get with Aroma, how about you walk us through the various games included? So each of the four games included in Aroma use different components, plays surprisingly different from the last, and features a unique method to determine start player, while at the same time setting up the game for play. Now, what I think I'm going to do here is summarize each of the four games at a pretty high level. The first is Discover. Each player chooses a board, puts it in front of them, forming a circle. The matching scent tray to the board is placed with the scent names on the boards. The start player is determined by dropping cubes from a the, the box height onto the board. Points are awarded for how close to the center these land. The starting player is the person who has the most points. They're going to collect five oils, and then everyone else collects five oils and put them in their tray. Now, each turn, you're going to pick an oil in your tray, smell it, and try to identify it. They're then going to pass it to the player on their left who says, yep, you got it right, or saying, no, I disagree. Now, if they agree and say, you got it right, and they're correct, you get a point. If they agree and are wrong, the active player gets the point. If they disagree and are correct, they then get to smell the oil and try to identify it. If they're correct, they get two points, but they get none if they're not. Or they can choose not to smell the oil and just take one point. Now, I think people will also quickly realize that the aroma of pure distilled oils is somewhat mm. different than what one might be used to. You might know what a lavender flower smells like, but the purified oil is just that much more intense, which can confuse the uh, nasal passages. Yeah, we were having a hard time with grapefruit and orange. Those felt swapped. Like, we're like, did they label these wrong? The next game is survive. Shuffle all the oils. Place them in the center of the table with five in front of each player. Technically, it says in a cross. Shout go. Everyone grabs an oil, looks at the bottom of it to identify it, puts it in their tray, and then finds the matching aroma token and puts it above that in the tray. First player to do all five of their oils becomes start player, but everyone's still going to have to finish because that's how you set up the game. You're then going to use the back sides of the board of this game for a reference, and they just have a list of all the different scents and the different categories. Now, the goal is to be the last player standings, with players being eliminated when all of the oils in front of them are identified. Each turn, you choose who to attack, you pick a scent, you try to identify. If you get it right, you take that token away. You take the, the aroma too. You also can't attack the same player two turns in a row. Once you eliminate a player, though, you do get a second attack that turn. At least it's nice that they included a mechanism to avoid ganging up on the one boor smeller in the group. <laughs> Next is Revolve. 
This is actually the first one I tried. You're going to, st- the, the, the intro game here has nothing to do with actually setting up. It's a small dexterity game where you stack the player pieces, then you put this disc that is only in the game, as far as I can tell, for this purpose. And then starting with the yellow player, you're going to put one cube in the center of the disc. And then the next person is going to put a cube, next person get a cube. The start player is the last person to place a cube without it falling over kind of fun actually dexterity game that i shared in my facebook feed and people wanted to buy the game just for that so that was amusing enough once that's done you're going to shuffle all the oils everyone's going to take five randomly and put them in their trays you're then going to take the leftmost oil from your tray identify it by looking at the bottom and put the tile that matches that face down on your board you're then going to pass the oil to the player on your left who then smells it. No, you'll be getting one from the player on your right. And then they're going to look through the aroma tiles and put that tile for what they think that guess is and on the board for whoever first had that oil. You keep repeating this until the oils get back to their owners, reveal all the tiles, get points for the ones you got right. Repeat this for three more oils. One of the things I like about this one is the player's fifth oil they collect at the beginning is not used. So you never have perfect information. So you can never automatically guess the last one because it's the only thing that hasn't been played yet. It's interesting that given the variety of oils present in the game with the four different groups of oils, there's Mm -hmm. a level of skill just in knowing what the scent could be, Mm -hmm. even if you can't specify which scent it is. At least narrowing down fruity, floral, or etc. gives you a fighting chance, much like in uh, beer tasting games. Yeah, and there is the process of elimination. You're like, oh, this is a citrus, and we've already identified orange and grapefruit, so I wonder if this is lime was definitely an aspect of the game, a meta game that came out while playing actually all of the games in Aroma. The final game is Collect. Each player picks a scent type and grabs that board and all the oils for that category and puts them in front of their board in a random order. You then determine the start player, which is done by putting the box over all the aromas and then throwing your pair of player pieces at the box cover. The player piece who ends up closest to the center of the box wins and gets to go first. They then select one oil from any one player and put it in their tray. This keeps going, going clockwise until everyone has five oils. Now, remember, everyone selects a specific type. So every time I take an oil from Sean, I know I'm getting a citrus, for example. Players then mix up the oils in their trays so you don't know which is which. Each turn, a player picks an oil from another player and tries to identify it. If they're correct and it's from their category, they collect it. If they're collect correct and it's from someone else's category, they give it back, but then get another turn. The winner is the first player to collect all of their five cents. Now, I haven't gotten a chance to try this one out for myself, but what are your overall thoughts on Aroma? Well, to start, I'm always looking for any game to do something totally new, whether it's using an old mechanic in a new way, combining mechanics in a way they haven't been done before, or coming up with something totally new and unique. And as far as I know, Aroma was falls into that last category of doing something totally new. So I decided to do a little bit of research on this one and digging around. And I honestly didn't expect to find much or if anything, maybe some scratch and sniff type games yeah. back in the 80s. Uh, so while I quickly found out that they weren't the first board game to use scent. And again, that okay. wasn't especially surprising. They aren't even actually the first game to use bottles of hmm. scents. Uh, 30 years ago, there was a board game shipping with small perfume bottles in a game called Fragrances, okay. uh, which was a Parisian game from the per- perfume manufacturers <laughs> trying to introduce people to the different components and aspects of making perfumes uh, in the game called Fragrances. So while it's been a while since anyone's done it in this manner, it isn't quite as new and unique as we had thought. Totally fair. I wonder if the the designer of Aroma ever heard of or played fragrances. It sounds like there might be quite a bit of overlap. Um, On the blog version of the post, I actually noted that I swear I had a scratch and sniff, a game with a scratch and sniff element. But if I remember, it was like when you land on the spot, scratch and sniff this kind of thing more to make it immersive than using the scent as a mechanic. There were there were another couple of games uh, more recently that used a um, specific patented um basically saturated paper so they took it was they right. had cards that were saturated with scent uh and those were boxed in the game but so yeah so not quite as unique as i thought now not knowing that these other games were out there when i heard there was a scent based game i had to try that out 
I happened to come up in a insider group. I'm on Facebook where the publisher was like, we're looking for reviewers. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to try this. Now, once the game actually showed up, I started to be a little more skeptical, especially once I recorded our unboxing video. Starting with the fact that component quality is just kind of all over the place. Now, the oils were great, right? They're in nice glass vials. It's spill proof. There's a lot of scent in each one. I don't think they're going to run out probably ever for the amount of times this game's going to get played unless you start goofing around with them, which you shouldn't do. Uh, the player boards are nice, thick card. The wooden bits are nice. The wooden cubes and the wooden player piece are nice. But the rest is just kind of tossed in there. Afterthoughts uh, feels like something my kids might have made in a in a like make a board game class. Uh, especially the trays for holding the sense, which is pretty key to the game. Like you're constantly pulling things in and out. They're just made of thin card, like thinner than a card deck box. Um, I was also disappointed with how few of the scent strips they give you. For a game that's like, do not put this on your skin, they don't really give you a lot to not put it on your skin. Uh, I would say there's probably enough for maybe two plays of each game, and that's it. Yeah, I also suspect that they know perfectly well that few people are going to actually use the scent strip. So after you give it a shake, you'll just sniff the bottle or waft the bottle waft. more directly. I, I, I will neither deny nor confirm that we did that. <laughs> Along with that is the fact the game seems to have been created as an advertisement. This is basically a big box you pay for to learn about organic aromas and their line of essential oils. Now, my biggest problem with this is the fact that while, yes, some scents and oils and flower-based products may have some actual medicinal curative properties, the claimed health benefits of essential oils are, I will just go so far as say, dubious at best. Now, to be fair, their website clearly states in small print on a back page drop down that no claims have been verified or intended and absolutely nothing they state is to be taken literally as it's all opinion and may in fact be completely out of date. Yeah. Now, I will say for playing the game, the only place you see these claims and the advertisement, except for the logo on the box, are those business cards. There is a business card for organic aromas with links and everything on there and what they sell and what they do. And there's a card for every single cent with its supposed properties. But there's nothing while you are playing the game that has you hear how Marigold is useful for treating acne and skin conditions which I still find highly ironic in a game that says, don't put this on your skin. Uh, the information on the cards is included, but there's no reason to use them. Now I can see people going the first time they smell every scent, reading these out. Not what I'd recommend. Now I won't beat a dead horse here. They're selling oils that smell really pretty and they made a game out of it. Fair enough. Game wise, we're going to drop that. I'm going to drop the concern of, of the curative properties of essential oils. Cause that's not what you're doing here. You're just trying to identify them to play a game that level i was really impressed by this uh you get four different games in this box and they're real games my biggest concern was this was going to show up and it was going to be one of two things it was going to be smelling gas the oil with like no real game to it just if you get it right get a point or it was going to be essential oil trivia smelling gas the oil and then which oil is good for curing back pain neither of those are here which is awesome i i was a little concerned the games that are here are pretty solid then there's the added bonus of those start player games. I actually really love the little mini games to start each session. I honestly think designers need to pay attention to this aspect of Aroma. Like try to find, especially the ones where that when you're done determining start player, all of a sudden the game's magically set up. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Like, can you imagine a game of tapestry where the first player to have their civilization and capital board picked out and your city board set up with all the thing and all your cubes on the board is the start player? Like that just sounds great. You'll have everyone rushing to get everything set up quicker than ever before. Though I do suspect that some gamers who thrive at the slow and methodical methods of their gameplay would bristle at the idea of their strategy game having a speed round. Yeah, and they'll be like, I can't be a civilization game. It has a speed round in it. Now, of all the games in Aroma, Discover was my least favorite, which makes sense. It features bluffing and, and social deduction, right? And I'm not a big bluffing fan. Of the other games, Survive was my favorite. Just something about attacking other players with their essential oils in front of them being their health was just kind of fun. That said, I'm saying these games are fun. They're neat. They're engaging. They're better than I thought. None of these are great. Like they, they all boil down to smelling oils and trying to identify them, which I will say was way harder than I expected. 
but there's a neat mix. Like there are four totally different games here, even though they're all just about smelling oils. And I thought that was cool. So, um, the, if you happen to already have a diffuser and enjoy essential oils to uh, scent up your home with and are thinking about putting the game to use after you've played, do not use these oils for that purpose. The website notes that they are not actually pure essential oils, but have been blended with other oils such as avocado and as such are unsuitable for use in your diffusers. It's weird because I swear the paper strips are diffusers. Like well, I think they, those the uh, organic um, the, the you put the thing in and then the scent travels they're, up. Yeah, they're, they're, they they've they're known for their diffusers. Uh, yeah, their, their fancy things. All right, so overall, Aroma isn't the kind of game I'm going to bring out regularly. This isn't going to be a game night favorite of my Monday night group or something. I'm going to be bringing to the local game store. It's kind of like a party game in a way, like something I'm going to bring out to show off, especially to people who haven't heard of it and haven't seen it. Like like I can see my line being, hey, check this out. Here's a board game that's about using your sense of smell. Like you're never going to see me break the aroma out at a board game blitz, though I could totally see bringing it out at 2 a.m. on an Extra Life event. Though at 2 a.m. I might actually wear gloves for for when (laughs) things slip as you're tired and delirious yeah. from lack of sleep i can totally see people chasing each other around the local game store with these so the final thing i do feel i need to mention is the price point this game is not cheap it has an msrp of 58 dollars us it's over 70 canadian uh well i understand it contains 20 essential oils and essential oils aren't cheap but that's a lot of dollars for what amounts to four mini games The price also makes some of those component issues I mentioned stand out a little bit more, especially those trays. Like you're giving me thin card to hold these glass bottles for that price point. So I, that's a toughie. Yeah. So all in, you're getting about 40 milliliters of fragrance in this game. They're, they're two milliliter uh, jars, bottles of it, which is about $60 $60 of product with your average 10 mil bottle being between 15 and $80. If you happen to want 10 mils of chamomile. Um, so again, that's the money is going to the oils and the yeah. jars and everything else you're getting is just kind of extra. Though I still even question that because remember, these are not only essential oils. These are just still down. So you got to realize they got to be worth a little less than those 10 mil bottles. Overall, Aroma was way more fun and interesting than I thought it would be. This is just not one game that uses your sense of smell, but four distinct games that use your sense of smell, each of which is quite fun and engaging as a short diversion. Is it worth the cost, though? To be honest, that's going to be up to you to decide. And perhaps a decision if you wish to support the company selling this and other products. Fair enough. Now, if you're looking for a unique board game experience, you may want to check Aroma out. Now, where I think this game may shine, if you know someone who is a fan of essential oils and they love essential oils and they love discovering new scents and it's something they have diffusers all over their house or whatever, I think this is going to make a really cool gift for an essential oils fan. They've already already uh, bought into the essential oils market Here's something cool they can do that they probably didn't realize exists. Now, the big thing here, though, is if you are sensitive to scents or have scent-based allergies, not only is this game not for you, you're not going to want anyone around you playing this game. And finally, I think it doesn't need to be said, based on the warnings we said earlier, this is not a game for kids. That's it for our look at Aroma from Organic Aromas. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Uh, So last Thursday, we recorded our Tapest review. And in preparation for that, I tried out the solo rules, which goes pretty good with our topic earlier today. Though I guess there's fantasy elements because they have cavemen with transistors. That's fantasy, right? It's definitely not Civ. Uh, Now, I already talked about 
the solo plays during our review last week, which will be going on live on YouTube this weekend. And if you're listening at home, you can already listen to it. The review is already live on the blog. You can read that now. Um, and I'll just repeat here. They were solid. It, it's a solid solo experience. The main thing I saw when trying it out was that my game was under 45 minutes long which is really good for like a heavier civilization building game. And it really gave me a chance to explore the civilization I was randomly built. And I honestly think playing solo is a great way and very valid way to become more comfortable with the various civilizations and to try some of them out. And of course you're playing solo, so you don't have to randomly take one, just pick a sieve you want to explore. Yeah, no, that's a, a great point, especially with a 45 minute game. You're not having to worry about delving into that full two hour experience of a multiplayer tapestry game just to find out that, oh, I, I don't like this civilization. Yeah. And this really doesn't work for me. Or I, oh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get this because I playing it this mm -hmm. way is wrong. Next time I need to play it yes. this way to maybe, you know, figure this civilization out. Yeah, that was more what I was finding when I was playing. I was like, ooh, I should have done that in a different order, <laughs> was, was was the revelation I had with the civilization I had. Now, what amazed me the most about this game session is I was playing it downstairs. Dee was putting the kids to bed, and when she finished, she came down, and she started taking some pictures for me. So she had me playing, so we could possibly put those in the in the uh, review. I drew a blank. I can't remember if any of them ended up in the review or not. Um and she ended up getting pretty invested in my game. Like she was like, Oh, you're gonna do that? What are you gonna do next? What do you oh what what's what is, what's the AI doing next turn, right? Um, and then when she was done, she wanted to give it a try herself, which she did. Now I will admit she didn't enjoy it as much as I did. Um, she noticed, like, yeah, okay, it worked, but I would much rather play with real people, which is kind of weird. Usually I'm more the extrovert, she's more the introvert. But um, she did admit. The, if you didn't have anyone to play with, right? If like uh, it's literally locked down, there's no one here to play with, this would be a valid and enjoyable way to experience tapestry. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's and it's certainly uh, interesting that they've put in such uh, you know the the multiple levels of Atoma uh, play mm -hmm. in there with the, the the both the Atoma and the Shadow Kingdom that you can break out even if it's a two player game. You've got that yeah. one AI that still plays. And there are six different difficulty levels for the Atoma. Oh, interesting. I, I, I got my butt kicked with level one. <laughs> so did Deanna. So they're not easy. <laughs> now, I'll admit I never do well in Tapestry. It's so good that the game makes me feel like I built things. Sorry, level two. Yes. I was thinking there was a level zero. Sorry, it's level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, level six. Uh, yeah. So even on level two, because level one is the easy difficulty where you start up on every track once mm -hmm. and the opponent scores less points. So anyway, enough about Tapestry for now until we play it again on Friday. Um, so one big milestone for us last week that isn't actually gaming related, but I just feel is notable because it's been a long time is Deanna and I went out to a pub, sat on a patio with real life people not at our table and actually surprisingly well distanced. Like the tables were 10 to 15 feet apart. Like this was a, not a crowded space at all, had some dinner and some beers. Now, normally for this kind of thing, we'd bring out the do Kive or Onitama or patchwork, but we weren't even sure we were going to get in because this is a, it's a pub that's within walking distance of our place. And it's a Friday night. And I'm like, and it's a patio. We specifically wanted to be on the patio, even though you can now dine inside with reduced capacity here in Ontario. So I didn't bring anything. Now, what I did have, though, is my phone, and on it, at some point, I put the Takedo app on there, the Android app. Now, I honestly have no idea when I bought this, but there it was, sitting on there, totally unplayed. I actually grabbed my phone to play Star Realms or Ascension, but then noticed Takedo, and I was like, all right. So it was definitely unplayed, because I opened it, had to patch, and then there was a tutorial that was really annoying and took forever which honestly wasn't annoying. It was just, I already know how to play. Don't I don't need to know how to play Takedo. And I couldn't find a way to skip it. After getting past that, we then chose to play a two-player game. And before it started, it gave me another tutorial that explained how the neutral character worked, which is a thing when you play two-player Takedo. Now, once we got through all the tutorials, we played through a game and wow, this app is good. Like, like really, really good. Not only does it nail the gameplay and track everything, for you, removing the honestly, I think, inevitable scoring mistakes that happen with the physical game. I don't think I've ever played a game where you redo the math at the end of the game and everyone was perfect. It looks 
beautiful, like really beautiful, fully animated graphics of characters walking the Takedo, graphics for each stop along the way. You get to see the characters you encounter, the counter spot. And when you take a hot bath, you can even see if the monkeys join in with you. I was super impressed by this app, and I strongly recommend this for any fan of Takedo. Uh, like, this is one that I'm thinking we may try to talk Sean, and I think you would need it on her phone, and playing it online because it won't need a PC. Because, like, I like we played it on BGA, and it works, but, like, this we can play on our phone, and it looks so much cooler. I, it was interesting, and actually, uh, someone else recently apparently found this, so maybe it's new, maybe not, or something. But someone else was recently talking about it on Twitter and pointing out how, oh, the best way to play Takedo is two-player. And I strongly disagree. Um, I, I like I, it two-player. I so love the bigger experience of <laughs> Takedo where you can't get everything. Like, you, there's just so much more competition involved in a four-player game of Takedo. I don't know. I, I still find two-player way more cutthroat than a three- or four-player game. Mm-hmm. Way more take that, way more stealing the opponent's thing they need, making sure they don't get stuff. I don't know. I've, I've always found the two players. We disagree on that one. Takedo, to me, I love it two player. I also like it four. And I, it's not that I dislike it at two. I just, I think for me, the bet, my, my favorite experience is the four player experience. Fair enough. Now, what I will say, this is almost at ascension level. This almost replaces Takedo for me. Now, what I didn't see is if it had the expansions. Because again, we both discovered that the first expansion crossroads for Takedo is a must have. That was not in here the game we played. Mm. Now, I bet you there's probably some downloadable content or something, but I didn't dive into that. Now, finally, this past week, we cracked open my copy of the Alien B movie Dinosaur Western expansion for Unfair. Well, technically, it was cracked open before. You can watch our YouTube unboxing video, but our first time actually playing it. And actually, at that point, not even all the the decks were unsealed. Uh, We played a four player game. Uh, We had Deanna, Brenda, Gwen, and I. It was Brenda's first time playing Unfair, which was pretty good. She watched us play the week before with Holly and everyone else. So she had a good idea of what was going on. Um, While we were tempted to just play with the four new theme packs, I basically ruled that we're better off just adding two at a time. So we ended up playing with dinosaur, western, robot, and jungle themes. Now, some thoughts on the two uh, new themes we tried out. Since I now know, having reviewed Unfair, I'm probably not going to be able to fit all this in our full review. So here's your insider info of what I thought of two of the themes in the expansion so far. Only played once. First off is Dinosaur. I wasn't a fan. I got beaten so badly playing this. Um, Though still doing good in score. Very frustrating deck, but I can see some people absolutely loving it. There are no, well, sorry, technically there's one. The dinosaurs aren't attractions. They're actually upgrades that you add to other attractions. And they explain in the rule book that thematically this represents that you have a dino pen outside your roller coaster or whatever to get people interested, which fits. Now, all the dinos are high star value, starting at two, like the, the lowest, smallest dino is a two with the T-Rex being a five, which you could put out the first turn of the game. So I get your part to five stars right away. Now, when using the dinos, there's a new phase that's at the start of every round before you've even drawn events, and it's called the dino rampage phase, and you can tell what's going to happen here. You roll 2d6, and you are trying to roll six or under. Sometimes a little bit better than that, like the tiny little dinos are four and under, but if you roll seven or higher, you're safe. Every dino, seven or higher, safe. Six or under, you may have a problem. If you do roll six or under, they rampage and they shut down rides and will also move around your park, eating other dinos because you can only have one dino on each ride and the highest star value survives because the other one gets eaten. So what will happen is your dino will rampage and then move to another attraction and then eat the dino there. The T-Rex shuts down your entire park. This happened to me two rounds in a row. One when I had four attractions, and the next round when I had five. This T-Rex shut down my entire park. That cost me the game. Now, if you don't mind, that random factor that I need to roll six or less and get tons of points early in the game, but you may get completely ruined, you might dig dinos. 
those two rounds where I got wrecked twice in a row was a little bit too much for me. Yeah, and see, this is this is an interesting thing. So I again, I play can't stop all the time, mm-hmm. and in can't stop, there's a whole bunch of times where you push your luck, and oh, I was so close to, to scoring a column, but you know, I I lost out and I got nothing. I'm out, you know, and then, you know, someone else was close to winning and the game's going to be over now, but can't stop is a quick and easy game. It's, Mm -hmm. it's very light. Whereas this exact same thing is happening here in unfair, but you've got more investment. So there is a sunk cost fallacy essentially that is more likely to affect players in Mm -hmm. this game compared to something lighter and fluffier like can't stop. It's the same thing happening. Yep. But it's it's it feels worse to you because of the effort you've put in this park. And especially if you're having fun and, you know, talking about your parks like we, we discussed mm-hmm. uh, the doing playing that metagame on top of it. It hurts that much more when you can't win because of a roll. Yeah. Now, I will note that theme pack does include things to mitigate the die rolls. Uh, there's one event where you automatically roll seven on all your die rolls for the rest of the round. There's only two of those in the entire event deck. Now, there are an upgrade called Electric Fence. I suggest anyone who doesn't like the random factor of the dinosaurs, wait until you have a couple of Electric Fences in your hand before putting the dinos in, and then you won't have anything to worry about. Except you're playing unfair, and someone will destroy your Electric Fence, and then you're going to have to roll and your whole park gets closed. So yeah, dinos, I I probably would never select this as one I want in a game I'm playing. If someone else puts it in the game, I am definitely going to wait to put dinos in my park until I have some way to mitigate my randomness. But again, I know people that are going to love the dinosaurs and that random factor in the chaos of it. So not for me. Next one I tried is Western. Awesome. Absolutely awesome pack. Very simple, straightforward, and forgiving. Lots of ways to make your park bigger, including ways to even build six attractions, have 10 more guests, and build both your showcases. I don't know why Western's all about over the top. The other thing is quality cards, tons and tons of things based on quality cards and multiple types, not just superior quality, but multiple types of quality cards in there. I don't know if they thought it was like the badges and the awards felt Western. I don't know. If you're using panoramas, all of the rides, or sorry, all the attractions in Western combine in any order. So you don't even have to worry about what order they are. They have matching backgrounds. So your Western town can be built in any order. Lots of really neat stuff. Um, And a good mix of other stuff. There is a take that element. Um, But I noticed the take that elements we saw not only hurt your opponent, but also hurt you. So one example is the gunslinger. It'll take out any one park employee, but you also lose the gunslinger. Western is simple enough that with the expansion, they've always presented, here's the decks you should use the first time you play. Western is now the deck you should use the first time you play, combined with some of the decks from the other game. Big fan of Western. I, I am really looking forward to like throwing that in more and more. Someone else picks Dinosaur, I'm going to pick Western just to try to even things out. <laughs> Interesting. No, I, I love the fact that they've you know created a new easiest or not net easiest yeah. but new this is the game that we want people to start out with and i put that in an expansion mm-hmm. uh one thing i have noticed and if you look at unfair dash the game or unfair dash game.com uh it appears uh and this is you know there's a number of different things that have pushed me in this direction but they are going to have 26 decks for this game Mm-hmm. They are planning on a full alphabet Long-term game. of decks. And so right now there are a uh, 10, 10 decks out, six in the first by six in the original and four in the expansion. Uh, and then there's another expansion that's coming out right now, yeah, which is another four in there. But yeah, they are heading for a full alphabet of decks based that's on what be I've been seeing. Of decks. So this weekend, I'm expecting to play some more Unfair and trying out those other two decks. I don't know if I'll ever try all four of the new ones together. Uh, The Aliens adds a new uh, resource to the game instead of money. You you are trying to earn Alien Prestige, and if you have lots of Alien Prestige, the Aliens gift you with advanced technology. And I don't even remember what's the other one. I'm drawing a blank. B-Movie. B-Movie is all about uh, panoramas. 
It's it's the first set to include panorama scoring. So despite the fact that Western, you can put them in any order, it doesn't matter if you're not playing with B-movies. So B-movies is supposed to be a mix of all the themes because they're B-movies, and it includes wildcard themes, and like I said, panorama scoring. It's the first set to use that officially, which I think is going to be a big part of the game. There's even a new action where when you build your ride, you can pay $3 to skip a spot to make sure stuff ends up in the right way. Oh, now again i haven't tried these other two decks it's just i read the rules for them in case people pick them sounds neat sounds interesting i just didn't want to deal with that and rampaging dinos and western the western was fine western toss in anyone who's not sure where to start throw western in all right well speaking of this coming weekend how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks all right so this coming weekend we have tons of gaming plans so friday night it should be you me deanna cat and tori our plans right now are to play a five-player game of Tapestry because they all love Tapestry. Sean needs to play it in person like he needs to. Um, and then playing through the second short adventure in Forest of No Return for Adventuria. Possibly starting off with a really quick Master Taylor's Poltergeist to teach Tori and Kat the game. I think that's probably going to be worth doing. Because at that first adventure with the, the, the dance and clothes is nice and quick with the nice simple decks uh, and then if we have time maybe some party games i'm really thinking of getting dude off the pile of shame because i have a feeling that'll be a good one for late at night dude and i'll just dude. be happy to play some games and see you guys as always now then you're going to be around for the entire weekend so we got a bunch of other stuff we really want to get played um one of the big ones for the pile of obligation is checking out draconis invasion I'd like to get in a game of Zaya, which Deanna has claimed she's never played with the expansion, so that'd be cool. And to be honest, Sean loves Zaya. I love Zaya. And I want pictures with the box insert being used for the review. So somewhat pile of shame. Um, we want to try out more themes and unfair and knock some more games off the games that Sean must play list. All righty. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Danielle Thomas. Thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly of the Excellent Gaming and BS Podcast. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Mr. Eich and Mark Podcast. Talking about games and game mastery. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to the end, to an end, and I'm tired and I need to go home. So we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Note patrons do get some cool, awesome bonus content, like usually over an hour to three hours of bonus audio, including audio from our Sunday brunch, as well as our outtakes from the show and our after show, behind the scenes blog posts and a copy of our pre-production show notes. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show, and stop by Sunday Spa for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.